One of the most critical yet underrated factors in contributing to our emotional health and well-being is our workplace environment. And that's largely because given America's traditional emphasis on work and financial gain, the workplace has become essentially a second home for many of us. But is it really possible to create a culture in those second homes that will help us achieve not only successful but flourishing lives? In their new book, Organizations for People, Caring Culture, Basic Needs and Better Lives, authors Michael O'Malley and William Baker say yes and present the principles and practices they called from some of the most nurturing companies in America, which they believe any business can adapt and follow in its own unique way. And joining us now is Dr. Bill Baker. Bill, thank you so Brad, much for joining very us. Very nice to be here. Thank you. It's a fascinating book. It's got so much in it. I'm going to try to narrow it down to the essence. Yeah, I saw that. I saw <laughs> your copy. As, I've never yeah, seen a book so far. You know <laughs> yeah. the book better than I do. I hope so. Let's see if I do. Okay. So, first of all, what does a people-centered organization look like? What are its defining characteristics? Well, I'd say first and foremost is a kind of authenticity and a uh, and trust and respect. Those are the big words. And if that's present, almost anything can happen. Uh, if there's fear, uh, if there's some kind of intimidation, if there's disrespect, it in the long run, and we have data like you can't believe uh, that it, research has been done on this subject over and over again by hundreds of scholars, it just doesn't work in the long run. Companies can do well managing by fear and intimidation, mm. but they can do well only for a short period. If you're in it for the long haul, uh, you, it has to be yeah. respect. So, you know, one of the words you didn't mention, but it's, it's problem, uh, predominant in the book, is, is kindness. Oh, yes. You course. say that a company has to be kind in order to be ultimately a nurturing workplace. But you also say that there's a difference between being kind and being nice. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Well, there's, there's a big difference. Uh, kindness means more than just, you know, acting, acting friendly to somebody. It means something much more genuine than that. It means a level of respect that, uh, that, that just being nice doesn't do. Being nice often is artificial. Yeah. And being kind is never artificial. Mm -hmm. What if you're a business in a very competitive industry? And all of your competitors, 100% of your competitors, are only focusing on the bottom line. So they have no qualms about overworking their employees so that they don't have to hire extra employees. And they have no compunction about doing the least they can about pay and benefits. Um, you know, I can see that in the long run, being a kind, compassionate, respectful organization, workplace, uh, will pay dividends. But you got to go through the short run in order to get to the long run. What does a company that wants to do the right thing do under those circumstances? Well, uh, uh, first, we do have a lot of research that shows that if you're in a company where there's respect and kindness, even in the short run, you're going to do all right. Why is that? Because you're going to wind up having the best people the most productive people. People are going to work harder for you. They're going to take less bathroom breaks. They're going to use their abilities uh, to the fullest uh, if they're in the right environment. If they're not, if they're always kind of looking over their shoulder, I think a good example is, is what happened in Wall Street. Many of the employees of those big Wall Street companies in 2007 mm -hmm knew that they that the Mercedes was going over the cliff. <laughs> but they were so afraid to tell their supervisors because they thought they'd get fired or they'd get yelled at or they'd get intimidated that they didn't say anything. And they took um, they took the entire global economy down. Uh, so you so even in the short run, if you have a kind environment, people are going to work harder and you're likely to be more successful. Yeah. And we've got uh, uh, Michael O'Malley almost killed himself doing all the research for our book. And he has 40 pages, as you know, of footnotes in the book, <laughs> kind of yeah. proving all of these yeah. uh, all of these studies. So, how are we doing in this country? What do employees generally? Did you find out how they feel about their their job and their workplace? Yeah, we sure did, and it's pretty discouraging. It's pretty discouraging. I have some figures. Yeah. 36% of the employees in this country 
say they have a dysfunctional <laughs> boss. Dysfunction. That's a big word, dysfunctional. It's even hard to spell. Uh, Seventy-five percent of the workers say that their boss is the most stressful part of mm. work. And a recent study in Canada had two out of five people quit because of a bad boss. NBC did a survey in 2015, said that most people would forego a 10 percent raise if they had a kinder boss. Really? So uh, why are we doing so badly? Uh, it's because we aren't kind. It's what we spend too much time watching movies and TV shows where we idolize the killer boss. But what do you do? You know, uh, people always gripe. You know, it's, it's, it's inevitable, even under the best circumstances. Even around here? <laughs> even I'm around shy. here. You take it, you know, I take it with a grain of yeah. salt when I hear that, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's some people I really trust. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I hear over and over again is, you know, I, I love my workplace. The top guy mm -hmm. or the top woman is great, mm -hmm. but my immediate supervisor mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. toxic. Right. Why, why do so many good CEOs allow toxic managers and supervisors in a workplace? Yeah, that is a problem, and frankly, one that I've been uh, guilty of myself. Uh, and often it's because of bad internal communication, that the top people who wouldn't allow that to happen if they really knew it was happening, uh, either don't have the systems through their human resources or haven't made enough effort themselves that they're guilty, that they haven't, you know, what, what I used to really be a believer in is walking around and talking to people and trying to get an understanding of really where my people mm -hmm. were. And uh, usually you can find out who the troublemakers are and who the, uh, the uh, supervisors are who are not delivering mm -hmm. or who are, uh, who are not authentic. So, um, but the big problem is often you take, to, and, and I'm probably as guilty as anybody of that, sometimes you don't, you, you, you try to give people more than, a, than the benefit of the doubt, yeah. and you don't move quickly enough mm -hmm. to solve the problem, and that can be mm -hmm. disastrous. So let's talk briefly, you know, you, you explored or analyzed 21 companies. Mm -hmm. First of all, why did you choose those companies? Well, we, uh, uh, the, the choice was by my industrial psychologist colleague, uh, Michael O'Malley, who had been studying companies all over America mm -hmm. for years. And uh, there are, you know, lists and studies that show who some of the better, more interesting and kind companies are. Mm -hmm. And he went and went after them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in some ways, they're almost all, all these companies are all pretty much private companies. Mm -hmm. But they're not teeny companies. They're not, they're, there's no company smaller than $50 million yeah. a year in sales. So, what, aside from what we've already discussed, what are some of the key lessons that that you came up with or that you learned, that you called from these, uh, from these companies that other companies can take advantage of? Yeah, well, I, th I think one of them uh, is uh, a Chinese word, mo, kind of how we brush against one another, allowing people to better communicate, employees with one another and with their supervisors. The other is a German word, Vergonnen. Hmm which is celebrating the success of other people in your company. Mm. Uh, you do a great job. We're, we might be competitive. We might be both the, uh, have similar jobs at the company. But something good happens to you that I celebrate you. Mm -hmm. That's a sign of a really, uh, mm. really healthy company. Uh, of course, kindness, uh, you know, the feeling of, of, of a place where you know that you're working with people that you can trust. And that's another element of, of kind leadership. It's not artificial. It's, it's, it, 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 it is that you understand that you can trust your boss, mm -hmm. that you might not even like your boss. You might not even like him, but you, can, but you feel you can trust him, yeah. that he's an honor, he or she is an honorable person. So these 21 companies were, I get the sense that they were always, their initial mission was to be kind yes. and nurturing. Mm -hmm. What's your experience with companies that didn't start out that way? Have you seen examples of where they have been able to turn it around? Yeah, uh, usually they don't. I mean, uh, and m most of these companies that we studied had leaders and founders who were so special that it, the companies reflected the personalities of the leader. That's pretty much always the case. There are some companies that have really had terrible leaders who've been really ugly people, and the entire company has felt that, and usually 
ultimately gets into trouble. Uh, sometimes the board says we've got to do something. There's a, there's a culture of hate and misery here. The only way to solve this is changing out the leader and trying to find a leader that cares about mm. uh, cares about the people that work there. That can turn things around, and it has on a few occasions. But what often happens, and I see it all, often in Fortune 500 companies, I know these CEOs who are just nasty, evil <laughs> people, and I say, oh my God, what about all the hundreds of thousands of people working for them? They're going to be paying the price, not this guy who'll get a golden parachute because he will get fired. But, uh, but it's all of these yeah. Employees who wind up paying the price, and often the companies get killed, they get merged, or whatever. And, and that leads to my final question, which is what's at stake in the larger picture, not just for the individual employee, for the company, but what's at stake for the country if things don't change, if we don't, don't develop more of these nurturing companies? Yeah, what, what's at stake for the country is significant because, in the end, uh, and we can prove it with data. Uh, kind companies do better. It will mean that uh, this country, this entire country, our civilization will slowly degenerate. Mm. Uh, you know, you think about other places. There, believe it or not, in a country like Germany, there are an awful lot of kind leaders of these mm. kind of Mittelstadt companies that are in the in the midsize. Some of the best companies in the world. And why are they some of the best companies in the world? Because they have leaders, they have a, uh, they have a culture of caring. Mm. And unless we get more of that in America, we're going to see this, comp this country slip. And of course, we mm. don't want to see that yeah. happen. Well, we'll get more of it in America if more employers read organizations for people, caring cultures, basic needs, and better lives. It really is full of wonderful, very important information. Bill, thank you so much for uh, joining thank us. Thank it's you, Raphael. Oh, it's great to be, great to be here and see you again. Yeah.